These are the texts for our Sunday school class for this coming Sunday, March the 3rd, and they'll be the texts we use in worship on Sunday, March the 17th. The first comes from my favorite book, Genesis, the 15th chapter, and uh, I'm going to read that text to you, Genesis 15, 1 through 12, and then it skips and jumps to um, hmm, 17 and 18. Yeah, 17 and 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. We're going to talk about that word reward because it can be translated three different ways. Two other ways, rather. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to know what, when I, that I shall possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a, lamb, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, and cut them in two laying each half over the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. And then we jump to verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces that are on the altar. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he goes on and uh, divides up how far the land goes in, in all kinds of ways. The second text um, that I intend to use is not going to be the, uh, the gospel text, which is Luke 13, 31 to 35. I'm going to use the Philippians text uh, beginning in the third chapter with the 17th verse and going through the first verse of the fourth chapter. And remember, chapters and verses, while quite often there seems to be a logical division, is um, uh, something that occurred much, much later and not in the original writings. So they are for our convenience. And just because something spreads over into a new chapter and doesn't continue means very little about um, the division. So beginning in chapter uh, 3. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation. It will be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Well, let's have some uh, uh, translation fun, first of all, with um, the book of uh, Genesis. Do you remember, well, let me put glasses back on. Do you remember uh, in the very first verse there when, when the Lord uh, appears to um, 
Abram, and he says, uh, don't be afraid. Um, your reward will be great. Okay, let's talk about that word reward. Uh, ever since the time of Martin Luther, that has tended to be the, the translation of this word, which is um, uh, shkir. Uh, you would you would write it in English as um, S H K R with uh, the the vowels there, which would make it more like uh, close to shkir, but more like shuk shakir, I suppose shakir. Um, but it also means, in addition to reward, it could mean wage, and it can also mean gift. Now, what's interesting about this word, and I would suggest that maybe a better um, translation of this word is, in fact, the word gift, is that the only other times it is used in a religious context in the Old Testament, um, once in Isaiah, once in Jeremiah, and one other place that completely slips my mind, uh, it's used as the word gift not reward and not wage as though it's something earned and reward as though it's something given in response to something you have done, but rather gift. So um, I expect that that's probably a better way to look at this. And what is this that we're looking at? This is the renewal of God's promise to Abram, not yet Abraham, to uh, Abram, that he will be a great nation. Now, we need to move back into Genesis to trace this through a little bit. At the very end of chapter 11, uh, verse 30, um, Abram and Sarah are noted in the biblical text as barren. They have no children, which means a couple of things. One is that in the eyes of the culture, that um, somehow Sarah is inferior. And the other is that in the eyes of the people of God's promise, they are not being blessed as though maybe they're not doing something right. Maybe they're not earning their own way so that God would give them a reward because Sarah is barren. And that tended to suggest to people that somehow if not God cursed, she was certainly not God blessed. And that would extend, of course, to the couple. And of course, in that day and age, it was always assumed it was the woman's fault when uh, there was barrenness. So God, in, in chapter 12, the first verse, makes a promise. Go to a land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Now, three chapters later, God makes this magnificent appearance to Abram. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your gift will be very great. And Abram immediately responds and says, I don't know what you're talking about because you made me that promise way back when, but we're still barren. We have no children. We're not going to be a great nation. And in fact, the, uh, the only person that I've got to be an heir for me is my slave. Now, this is a fascinating thing that takes us a little bit far afield, and I probably wouldn't use it in a sermon, but for a Sunday school class, uh, for your own thought process, I think it's uh, pretty interesting. Nowhere in, in the Hebrew culture, in the Israelite culture of ancient days, is there any custom or law that if a couple were barren, then one of their servants would become an heir. It's nowhere to be found. But throughout the Middle East, in that ancient culture, um, there's some writings, and again, I can't think of what they are, uh, that go back to um, at least uh, 1500 B.C. that indicate that that was, in other cultures, the uh, typical process. If a couple were barren, then a slave would become the heir, although even that's a little bit ambiguous. Um, it suggests, in the only writing that I can recall, it suggests that the reason that a slave would become heir is to make sure that uh, the barren couple uh, or, the, or the surviving person who died last of the barren couple were properly 
buried and that there was enough money there for that slave to see to the proper burial. So take that for what you will, but it certainly is clear that uh, Abram is very connected to the cultures around him. And in fact, he came from Ur of the Chaldees. And no, I haven't done the work to see if the Chaldean culture uh, was one that that had this um, this rule about uh, a slave being heir, at least for the purpose of burial. So Abram, at least from that culture, perhaps from his interaction as a roaming uh, Aramean across multiple cultures, has certainly experienced that. But that is not God's plan. And that's also the plan that Abraham is challenging God with. What do you mean you're going to reward me? Or what do you mean you're going to gift me as a great nation? You've not done anything for me yet. We're still barren. And he goes on for a couple of verses about that. A a real sense of complaint. And then God responds again and reminds him that this is the promise takes him outside and says, look at the stars. Your, um, your uh, uh, descendants are going to be this numerous. And at the end, the text says, Abram believed. Now, there's no proof that anything's going to happen, but at the end, it says, Abram believed. And here is the key. And his belief was counted to him as righteousness. Not his actions, not how good a person he was. His belief was counted to him as righteousness. Um. That's a a key theological element for us to hold on to, Uh, and it certainly applies to us because there is simply not a thing that uh, you and I can do in in our uh, physical practice of life that's going to make us worthy, and certainly um, emotionally and uh, mentally there are times that uh, our own experience of faith almost vanishes like a, a moist whiff on a, on a hot, sunny day. But it is that sense of trust uh, that was counted to Abram as righteousness. And I dare say that even when we see no evidence of, of the faithfulness of God, that by trusting that it is there, the same way uh, Abram did in the middle of the barrenness of the couple, that it is counted as righteousness. What an incredibly powerful statement. And that's another reason that I uh, really prefer this as gift, because there is no proof that Abram can look at around him that indicates that God is guaranteeing God's promise. He just, in the end, believes it again, and uh, uh, it's righteousness before God. Now, the Philippians text is going in a different way, and um, we really don't know who these people are that are skewing the gospel in Philippi. We have a couple of possibilities that, uh, in a fascinating way, go in opposite directions, but Paul could mean either of them, or maybe Paul in his own skillful way means both of them, by um, his use of their God is their belly. So let's take the uh, most obvious of those two first, and that would be the uh, group known as um, libertines. Those who, by um, the announcement of the, the gift of Christ and that Christ's redemption for Christ's own people, now take it as though their bodies don't mean anything, and they can do anything and everything they choose to do, and it makes no difference because the gift of Christ is that they're claimed by him regardless. And so they can frequent the temple prostitutes. They can bask in um, uh, drunkenness. They can misbehave in any way that you and I think of misbehavior, but it's okay. In fact, 
we are, we are basking in the grace of Christ all the more that we do things that we know Christ would disapprove of because he's claimed us. And so therefore we demonstrate that claim by our misbehavior. You see that kind of logic? I don't have to bargain with God to get God's gift. God has given it as a gift. And so therefore I can do whatever I want. And that by doing whatever I want demonstrates to God that I belong and that I trust and that I believe. Pretty neat logic, don't you think? But the other group that Paul might have in mind, and it would still be framed well by their God is their belly, are the, uh, the ones that um, in the early New Testament are called the Judaizers. And that means that they are convinced that the way they demonstrate God's claim in their life, Christ's claim in their life, is by obeying every piece of the Old Testament law. All of the dietary law, hence their God is their belly. All of the, uh, the religious law, uh, hence you can't travel but a certain distance on the Sabbath. And so they respond by um, to the gift of Christ by saying we're going to be obedient to every single element of the law. You know, it's interesting then that what Paul says to the Philippians is imitate me. Now, uh, oftentimes I think of that as Paul's own um, arrogance. And uh, uh, it, it, it could be. He often seems, in my mind, to be a, a rather a cocky fellow. But think about who Paul is for a second. Paul frequently claims that he is a Pharisee. And he frequently claims that he is righteous under the law. And yet what we know about Paul is that Paul, in his own way, has said he has put aside the law because the law was a mere tutor for us that demonstrated our weakness before the law and that therefore we needed Christ and that our belief in Christ is what counts to us as righteousness. We've heard that before in, in the book of, uh, of Genesis. So when Paul says, be imitators of me, he is certainly not saying, I'm like a libertine, nor is he saying, I'm like the Judaizers but rather I have found a different way, which is my own sense of response before God that leaves me free to do the things that I think are righteous. And even when they're not quite righteous, I know that my belief in Christ is counted to me as righteousness. I hope I'm making a distinction of where Paul is coming as a kind of a middle way. This isn't moderation in all things. It's something entirely different. Uh, it's not a matter of excess or denial. It's a matter of not putting our ourselves, our bodies, in the middle of a relationship with Christ. It's a matter of constant engagement with Christ and a constant sense of perception with Christ as how Christ might be leading us. And that, in fact, is how Paul behaved. Uh, think of it this way. When the Christians back in Jerusalem were still wondering whether Gentiles could receive the gospel, there was Paul engaging with Gentiles, eating with Gentiles, frequenting Gentile establishments, spending most of his career with people who were not Abraham's descendants, not the chosen race, but with those that, that the Judaizers would simply hold as uh, outcasts. And yet here's Paul. And so Paul is opening up this whole different way of, of um, living before Christ, not in just complete libertinism of doing whatever I feel like doing and not as a Judaizer of I'm going to remain strict and denying myself things, but rather this ongoing um, relational engagement where by the leanings of Christ we have a strong sense of what is right and what is wrong. And while some of my sensibilities about that may differ from some of your sensibilities about that, 
generally we both know that we are listening for that guidance from Christ and that guidance for Christ is good not just for our spirits but good for our whole person. Well, there you have it. That's our uh, Sunday school lesson for this coming Sunday. I'll look forward to being in there with you again to hear your thoughts about these two texts. Once more, Genesis, the 15th chapter, the first 12 verses, and then 17 and 18, and then uh, Philippians, the third chapter, beginning at verse 17, and going through chapter 4, verse 12.